Right. I'd like to tell you a little bit about Roger Babson, the man who decided to get rid of the spores once and for all and save us from gravity. So, oh, there's going to be so much science in this talk. So Roger Babson was obsessed with two things, gravity and rocks. We're also going to have a lot of rocks in this talk. Rocks. So Babson's obsession began when his little sister, so he was 18, it was 1893, and his 13-year-old sister was trying to save a friend of hers in the river, and she drowned, and it was very sad. Now, most people have just been like, that's really sad, I won't let my sisters, the rest of my sisters swim in rivers, but he had a slightly different take. In his essay, aptly named, <clears throat> Our Enemy, uh, Our Public Enemy, Gravity, because uh, he was not one to bury the lid, he specifically called out gravity as that dragon that had brought her down. So he'd actually given the force of gravity agency. So he had a personal vendetta, which carried him through throughout his life. So he came into contact with gravity again as a young man developing tuberculosis. Now, that, that's that beautiful uh, microbe up there. At the time, the cure for tuberculosis was to go out west or go somewhere really, really cold and be in dry air, because dry air is easier on the lungs. What makes air wet? Gravity. So he's like, all right, this is terrible. I'm never leaving Massachusetts. So he called up his friend Thomas Edison. They built a fancy coat with a heater in the back. He went out of Massachusetts air. He was spiting gravity. He was winning. Unfortunately, that did not last. Um, the final straw that pushed him over the edge into pure gravity hatred was his grandson was trying to save her friend in the lake and also drowned. So Babson's good humanitarians, bad swimmers. <laughs> After that, the old man had it coming. So in the same screed, he calls out old man gravity as the guy who breaks bones and destroys your health and he was gonna take him down. Yeah. yeah. So many, many people have tried to take down gravity in history. Some of my favorites are uh, Lathwaite, who decided that he could show that gyroscopes were non-Newtonian, and did not show that, spoilers, but did invent the maglev accidentally while he was trying to do it. Yeah, there was a lot of science there. Um, <laughs> and then there was Heim, who was trying to have energy-free propulsion, which he and his friend Werner Ron Brown were really excited about. Um, fun fact, he has no hands because his lab exploded. Um, <laughs> science. <laughs> and he did not manage to have propulsion-free um, levitation. However, he did could plant the seeds of what are real tractor beams. So tractor beams are not science fiction. They're actually possible, especially if you're very, 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 very small. <laughs> Unfortunately, the only way to realistically defy gravity is a bit of magic and a mezzo-soprano range. <laughs> All right, so these guys couldn't do it, but this MIT trained engineer, right? Like, he was hot stuff. He thought he could do it. However, there's a really good reason why this wasn't possible. So um, this is the patent for a gravity shield by a guy named Wallace. I'll note the date is 1971 here, which is horrifying on so many levels. But <laughs> great year. The fact that people in the room remember it and there were still gravity shields coming out is, I think, something we should note here. Um, <laughs> that said, I'd like to do a little experiment with you guys. So. Does everybody here believe in conservation of energy? Please say yes. Thank you, because otherwise there is going to be some nasty thermodynamics and some Greek, and I did not want to go there. All right, so pretend I had a gravity shield right about here. All right, so I have a little Harvey. You know, a little Harvey? Hi, Harvey. So we poke him up, and with no additional force and a tiny little tap, he goes to the top of my shield, and he gets to the top, and he falls. Gravity is a terrible, terrible menace. What I just did there is I created energy out of nothing, which, as we know from our thermodynamics, is a no-no. So gravity shields cannot exist, QED. Now, 
Coming back to Babson, I would like to tell you that he was like, yes, whoops. All right, coming back to Babson. I'd like to tell you that he was like, okay, conservation of energy, I can work around that, but no. This is him telling investors that if I make gravity shielding, here's how I'm gonna design a free energy machine. So he, very smart guy, a big of a crackpot. And that brings us to Newton. He was obsessed with Newton. This is the only math I talk, I promise. Um, so Newton, as we all know, was the first to characterize gravity kind of quantifiably. Um, fun fact, that G, the gravitational constant, that wasn't Newton, that was Cavendish 70 years later. Cavendish does not get the credit he deserves. I know, right? <laughs> credit. But he was so obsessed with Newton that when he founded one of the three colleges he founded, Babson College, um, Babson had an entire wing dedicated to Newton memorabilia, including this bed that he brought over from England so that he could have the place Newton slept. Now, creepy, yeah, right? Um, he was so obsessed with Newton that he took the idea, so as you all know, Newton's third law is paraphrased as action and reactions are equal and opposite, right? So you get an equal and opposite reaction. And with a little bit of help from uh, his professor, Roger Swain, uh, he decided to apply this idea to finance. <laughs> right? Because what goes up must come down. It makes perfect sense. Um, this is the Babson chart. In fact, Babson charts and Babson lines and Babson graphs are still a thing today. This is all over modern finance. And that's because it worked. At least it worked once. So right, like, with expected value, as long as variance is on your side, right, you can look like you're doing really well. So every year, he would say, like, in the 20s, he's like, you know what, what goes up must come down, what goes up must come down. And then in 1929, he said that there is going to be a crash, and it is going to be terrific. And this was September 5th, and on that day, uh, the Dow dropped 3%, which is now known as the Babson break. Um, just a month and a half later was Black Tuesday. And so he was the only economist or otherwise that successfully predicted the Great Depression. And so he made a pile of cash on this. And he gained validity for his Babson report, which is still going on, and his financial institution, which as of 2004, was handling $1.2 billion and still exists. And to celebrate, he made himself a rock. <laughs> okay. But the real important thing that he could do with his dirty, dirty lucre was to form his Gravity Institute. So he created an institute that, to this day, annually sponsors an essay contest, originally focusing on defying gravity, now focused on speculative physics. And even back in the 60s, you might notice a familiar name up there. Um, there have been four Nobel Prize winners who, in fact, uh, placed in an essay contest, noticed that uh, Dr. Hawking just came third. So I'd really like to see the other two talks. But Every year, he's gathered people today, and this is actually a really, really well-renowned essay contest now. This dude didn't last, unfortunately. It's a bar now, um, and it has a terrible Irish name. It used to be called the Gravity Bar, and I really have no idea why they stopped that. So again, he celebrated. He made himself another rock. He made sure his institute was somewhere safe because missiles scared him. And then he decided to build some more rocks. So, right, he was interested in propagating this idea of defying gravity, and so he tried to get universities to help him. So he gave uh, 13 universities $5,000 each, so roughly around $40,000 in today's time, which, to give you some context, is like two years of the life of a grad student, or one yeah, moderately nice lab bunch. And so with that money, um, he kind of seeded this idea that you could defy gravity and some schools took it seriously, some schools did not. Um, many people tried tipping over these rocks to see if they would fall. Um, some, a team at Tufts actually dug a hole, buried it to see if it would rise again. Unfortunately, it weighed a literal ton, so that did not work so well for them. As far as I know, everybody lived. Um, actually, to this day, the cosmology department there uses their rock to uh, celebrate people's graduations. So you drop an apple on your student's head, if the apple floats, you guys go home, wait for the call for Sweden. And if the apple drops, then he has a lot to think about or she has a lot to think about. 
So I'm supposed to end this on a friendly note. I could tell you about all the things that Babson did that I don't have time to. So like he authored 40 books, he founded two towns, three colleges, he invented the first parking meter, but <laughs> he was all over the place. <laughs> But instead, I'm just going to quickly tell you about a nice thing he did during the Great Depression, where, if I remind you, he made bank. So he employed local stonemasons to build a bunch of these stones with positive sayings to both give them money and lift the morale of the town on what's now still existing as the Babson Trail. So you can kind of walk around and see these happy little messages. Yes, it's the only map to I've made maps. All right, and so with that, I'd like to raise a toast to that dragon, to old man gravity, and the crazy, tenacious, odd eccentric who's gonna take him down. <laughs>